I'm Jeff Sturgis from Whitetail Habitat Solutions and I really wanted to talk about my top five deer habitat, deer hunting improvements uh, that you can make on your land. And um, it's interesting because several, as they relate to each other, push a lot of other wildlife species too. And, uh, and that's always important too. On the property here in Minnesota, we're pushing for turkey nesting habitat, grouse habitat, pheasant, rabbit, and of course deer. So I'm gonna, there's, this is in no particular order. It's interesting, we're in a spot where you have a bunch of hinge cuts made. And this is not a hinge cut video. In fact, out of my top five habitat improvements, hinge cutting is a, is a part of that, but it's not one of the top five. And see these hinge cuts right here, what we've used these hinge cuts for is we actually have a big cutting in the aspen right behind these hinge cuts. This is all hickory right here. So I wanted to cut and hinge cut these. I want them to stay alive. I want them to produce a lot of side cover. It's actually really good screening in the screening wall right here for this food plot adjacent. So I want this to be thick. I want deer to feel like they can hide on the back side of this. We want to make sure we left big openings through these hinge cuts so the deer can get in and out. And these hinge cuts serve to get a lot of sunlight into our cuttings in our, on our aspen. Those aspen cuttings will be about 7,000 shoots per acre really important that we get that sunlight into here. So kind of this edging right here, that's what we're using hinge cuts for. But really, the first one we'll talk about is just timber cutting, timber cutting in general. This is an open area that had a lot of birch in it, and then a little bit of oak, and then a lot of aspen. So what we did is we chose to focus purely on the aspen, a few of the birch that were in the way, to get those pockets of regen uh, for deer, grouse, uh, really important for grouse habitat and then create this edge habitat that we'll talk about along here with the hinge cutting uh, for turkey nesting. So hinge cuts here, we, we're not expecting deer to bed under these hinge cuts. I don't want you to get mixed up with that. These are a screening wall for the outside. They're letting sunlight in and it'll create a living bush that grows. It'll be just fantastically thick in here and it'll continue. So when we get up, get up in here, we'll start getting side sprouting off the top of these hinge cuts right here and they'll grow, it'll thicken up this area. Uh, now, maybe a fawn will hide under here, but certainly some rabbits. Uh, but we don't expect deer to actually bed under those. That's not the idea of hinge cutting. It's more to make that screening wall. So we have two pocket cuttings down here, and we've created at least 18 to 20 different pocket cuttings around the entire property so far. We're actually cutting more this weekend, but that's been over the last three years. So we've done a lot of work out here. Those are all about an acre in average in size. So a lot of work, a lot of chains, tanks of uh, chainsaw gas. And, and then that mixes in, in this location anyways, with switchgrass. And what we've done here is this is mowed and, and one-year-old switchgrass through here. So we're gonna hit it with some simazine before spring green up. And then I'll hit it with a mowing in early May, end of April, when the switchgrass and the weeds are about 10, 12 inches high then we should be able to let it go for this year. But if you can see, we've used a combination of hinge cuts on both sides. That's allowed a lot of light across this entire top to get in. So we have sunlight hitting the ground, making regeneration. We're getting briars, hardwood regeneration edge. And then we have the switchgrass line that goes all the way down this and extends for about 150 yards down this point. That switchgrass is used for thermal protection, screening protection. It's also when you have that grass briar hardwood regeneration line, it becomes exceptional turkey nesting habitat. And that's what's lacking on a lot of properties because you have hardwoods to ag land and there's no in between. Turkeys need that in between, especially that upland mix with then hardwood regeneration and briars for, for nesting and to protect those poults. So if you don't have that type of cover, those young turkeys are sitting ducks for predators and that's a very bad thing. So. We're using that combination right here. Now switchgrass to me is a base form of cover. The last thing we want to do is take this entire top, which you can see between the tree, trees right here might be 100 feet wide times 200 feet long, whatever that distance is, or, or 200 yards long. The worst thing we could do is just clear this all out and plant a bunch of switchgrass and go that, have that go right to hardwood. We want a lot more diversity than that. We want a lot more uh, browse for deer with that hardwood regeneration. Briars create that hardwood regeneration. So switchgrass alone would not be the puzzle. In fact, switchgrass alone is bad for deer bedding. You want to have hardwood regeneration mix in. So we have areas out here that we're converting where you surround that area of say four acres in, in switchgrass, 
30, 40 feet wide on the outside. Then on the inside, you might have some switchgrass pockets, but then we're putting in browsable shrubs like uh, hybrid poplar, red osier dogwood, dappled willow. Those are three species. Briars come in and regenerate within that field. So we have that best of both worlds where we have existing shrubs we're using like gray dogwood. They're there, we're keep maintaining those pockets pockets of briars, then we're filling in some of those other areas with browsable shrubs and switchgrass. Again, surrounded by switchgrass. The pockets might only be an eighth of an acre, tenth of an acre in size of switchgrass on the inside, but we don't want solid grass because then deer won't bed in it. And it's really limited towards other creatures too. Birds, butterflies, bees, there's no flowers, there's no pollinators. We have our pollinator blend that we sell through our seed company. That's a welcome addition to that area. But bottom line is we need diversity and that's what we've tried to create with this top. Switchgrass is just a part of that, but switchgrass is excellent for screening your access in and out of stand locations. It'll get six to eight feet tall. It's the only grass in the north third of the country really that'll stand up to a brutal winter. And even then it has its limits, but big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, any other grass will not stand up to that winter. Our switchgrass right now is actually bouncing back up. So it'll get crushed with heavy, the heavy weight of wet snow and ice, but then it just stands right up. So switchgrass and then timber cuttings. Hinge cuts are part of those timber cuttings. And when we go to a client property, might recommend hinge cutting on approximately 15% of all parcels, and that's about it. In this case, we're not using the hinge cuts to create bedding, we're creating screening for the actual bedding and regeneration that takes place on the inside, switch grass up against these hinge cuts. And again, it gives us that huge amount of diversity. And, and at that point, those hinge cuts are part of that diversity, but they're not the goal in and by themselves. It'd be hardwood cutting regeneration, which is so critical for all wildlife. And then the switch grass. And then we talked about already uh, making mock scrapes. Those mock scrapes are so sim simple. I use a hanging vertical vine. Been teaching that for many years. We want that waist high. We want a vine that is five to eight feet long. If it's really open between trees and you're using a rope at 12 feet high to hang down, we prefer six inches, a foot of rope at the most. You might have a seven foot vine then at that point, eight foot vine. It's coming from a, a, an area that's fairly open. So to deer, the opposite would be you have a one foot vine or stick hanging there. It's very unnatural just for that to be suspended there. We're putting that over a trail so a three quarter inch to one inch branch or vine. If you don't have vines in your area, then you can use a stick that deer like to rub, a branch of some type, uh, white oak, hemlock, jack pine, aspen. Those are just some of the ones that you could use that deer frequent and frequently use for rubbing. Now, the one thing about that is we like using the vine because it's very resilient. It lasts for many years. We've had some vines that have lasted for five, six years or more and we haven't had to change them. They're very resilient to being used. But what you find is you put it on a flat level area right on a deer trail. So if I had in this opening right here, we're gonna get a lot of deer going between here just to go back down to bedding, come up here. <clears throat> if I put a vine right here, if I had a stand location in this area, which I don't, we have one at the back side of the bedding over here for a morning stand. But if I put a vine right there and put a camera on it, our reveals would show a ton of activity, but I'm gonna put that vine right in the middle of the deer trail Every buck, doe, fawn that walks by will leave its preorbital gland scent on that branch and it makes a perfect addition to every one of your stand locations. So that's a really critical one. I kind of toy between that and food plots and water holes as being my favorite. As far as the effort for the reward, they'll hit mock scrapes. You can put a camera on it year round and they'll hit it year round. Every time they go through that trail, they'll hit it, they'll leave their scent move on. The more deer that leave their scent, the more sun accumulates, the more they use it. It's a vicious circle, but when they hit that mock scrape, they're not looking at you in a stand or the camera. They're just really focusing on that mock scrape. So that's one of my favorites. Um, kind of like you can't have one without the other. And that really applies to the next one. So we have hardwood cuttings, switch grass, mock scrape. And then the next one I really love is a water hole. And where you have dry areas, now, people will say, well, I have a creek on my property or a swamp, or I have a pond behind our cabin. Well, that doesn't mean those deer want to go all the way out of the way to hit that pond behind your cabin and go out there. So a water hole, if deer are traveling from dry bedding areas to dry bedding areas, dry bedding areas to food sources, it makes a perfect spot for a water hole. We have water down in these bottoms in just about every area on our property. Yet we have eight water holes up here on the top rim all the way around. They're all like three, 400 yards apart. 
we have deer hitting those water holes. They're not gonna go all the way down to the bottom, all the way down back up. They're in line with their movements of bedding and food, and they make exceptional spots to hunt, especially when it gets colder in October. Why when it gets colder? Because bucks are starting to cruise, they're moving around and they work up a thirst just like you or I would if we're working out during the winter time and it's cold, you still work up a thirst, you still sweat, you need to replenish that with water and that's when the deer seem to start to hit it the most, especially late October, November when it's during the rut. And boy, if you still have water during December and January in a, in a winter that's maybe a little bit mild, deer will come from a long ways to hit those. So the perfect complement to a stand location, and what we use, we like using our 300 gallon tanks. That's our most favorite, at least 100 gallons though. But 300 gallons seems to be that sweet spot where you could fill it and then it'll hold water throughout the entire deer season. You won't have to refill it in a dry deer season. I like tanks because we don't have mud on the outside of the tanks. We actually use a forage blend of rye grass and clover. It's not a food plot. It's for high traffic areas of human traffic or deer traffic. And so we put that around there to hold the soil very, very important for doing that. But bottom line is we don't have dry and cracking mud, mud that helps propagate the midge that forms EHD. So those tanks to me are much safer than natural pond or water hole in the woods where you have that dry receding cracking mud towards late summer. And that's where EHD really takes a stronghold. And so those tanks to me are much safer because you just simply don't have mud around that tank like a natural water hole. I believe they're actually safer than natural water holes. So uh, pretty cool to have. And then finally, we talk about water holes, mock scrapes, switch grass, hardwood regeneration, our food plots. If you have private land, obviously, then you're really missing out if you have food plots. If we just have these bedding areas back here with switch grass and all this diversity, there's absolutely no reason for deer to be here other than they're being pushed by the neighbors just simply for the good cover alone. They want to find that food. You know what travels the most? to find food or bucks. They have a home range five times more than does do. And so they're, they're the ones that are going to reach out and really travel a long ways to find that exceptional food. And that's where we want to have those food plots. You can see out here, we have food plots covered in snow right now. So we're just in the planting phase, obviously, not the planting phase. We have the corn in the background. We have a stand on that side that we can approach behind a screening wall, bunch of logs and debris get into a stand location. We have a stand location on the back side of the bedding. We access from a completely different location around the food. And then we have a water hole over there in a stand location coming to and from this food source and bedding area. So we've tried to match everything in one location with a food source stand, a morning bedding area stand, a water hole stand for all day cruising. When you put all those together, you have the perfect picture of all of my favorite deer habitat improvements just in one location, let alone spread throughout the rest of the property. So I hope you enjoyed my top five. It's hard to put them in order. Like I said, it's, it's hard to determine which came first, the chicken or the egg. They're all important um, equally. And so we've tried to spend a lot of time over the last, this will be our fourth season working on the property in Minnesota, installing all of those improvements on the property, relating them all and really creating white tail habitat and deer hunting habitat with a purpose. Hope you enjoyed these five, try them on your land. If you have questions, put them down in the comments below. I sometimes check those out. I appreciate you watching and uh, really encourage you to try each one of these going into this fall. They can help your hunt, not years down the road, but this year, this season, while you're deer hunting.